A very good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for waiting patiently. We are about to get underway. Welcome to the Tata Steel Literary Meet 2015 being held at the Victoria Memorial Hall in association with the Victoria Memorial Hall. I would now like to request Dr. Jayanta Sengupta, Secretary and Curator of Victoria Memorial Hall, to kindly deliver his welcome address. His Excellency, the Governor of West Bengal, and the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of Victoria Memorial Hall, Honorable Sri Keshrinath Tripathi Ji, Mr. Raskin Bond, one of the true legends of Indian writing, Ms. Malavika Banerjee, the Director of the Kolkata Literary Meet, Mr. Koshik Chatterjee, Managing Director of Tata Steel, the Chief Sponsor of the Meet this year, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of everyone in the Victoria Memorial Hall family, I warmly welcome you to this inaugural program of Kalam, or the Kolkata Literary Meet 2015, which, as all of you know, of course, is a five-day extravaganza of conversations about literature and the creative arts featuring some of the foremost authors and artists of our time. Uh, this is the second year running that we are partnering with Kalam to co-host the Kolkata Literary Meet. And the reason why we are doing this is because we thought that having these conversations in this lovely campus, in the backdrop of this magnificent building, this effortly notwithstanding our modernization is going on, we thought that this combination would give these conversations an ambience that would be impossible to replicate in any other setting. And the support of our Honorable Trustees, led by His Excellency the Governor, made this possible. And we are deeply grateful to you, Your Excellency, for so kindly taking the time to be with us here today to inaugurate this iconic festival. And then, of course, the members of Team Kalam and Team Victoria Memorial Hall work together to get these grounds ready for this meet. So, here we are for the second time in the running. I know all of you are waiting very excitedly for the proceedings to begin, so I welcome all of you once more very warmly to the inauguration of the Kolkata Literary Meet 2015, and we thank you very much for being here. Please enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Jankar Singh Gupta. Uh, Tata Steel, as we all know for years, also makes steel, but they also support literary meets like this. So I would like to request Sri Koshik Chatterjee, Group Executive Director, Corporate and Finance of Tata Steel, to kindly address the audience. His Excellency, Honorable Governor of West Bengal, Shri Tripathi, respected Mr. Raskin Bond, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon and a warm welcome to the Tata Steel Kolkata Literary Meet 2015. Kolkata has literally been uh, the capital for literature for India and, and some of its famous sons, like Tagore. Bhongin Chandra Chattopadhyay, Michael Modhushudunda, Kazi Nazrul Islam, Shant Chandra Chattopadhyay, Suri Gangopadhyay and many many others have provided India and the world a liberal and intellectually rich literary canvas for generations. Kolkata and Bengal therefore have a long history of patronizing and cultivating good literature and it is befitting that Kolkata has its own literary meat with this iconic backdrop behind us. In recent years, literary meets have emerged as a popular platform for exchange of ideas, sharing intellectual experiences, and engaging in healthy debates. However, to a Calcutton, this is a very familiar form of Adda, which has been this city's tradition through generations. This year's lineup of events of the Tata Steel Kolkata Literary Meet <coughs> is structured to promote the spirit of Adda in its truest form. At Tata Steel, we take pride in our efforts to promote and preserve art, culture, and literature. The Tata Steel Kolkata Literary Meet is one such event that is aligned with our corporate philosophy to encourage and support organizations and initiatives that fosters intellectual and cultural pursuits that help in building a liberal and ethical society. We are therefore extremely happy to be associated with the Kolkata Literary Meet. We are also privileged to have Mr. Raskin Bond at our inaugural function. He has been my personal author ever since I read The Night Train to Dearly in my high school. I am sure his presence in this meet will take the intellectual quotient of this meet to a very different level. Finally, on behalf of Tata Steel, I would like to thank all of you for coming to this inaugural meet and also to participate, would request you to participate in the function over the next five days and enjoy the level of intellectual interactions from the luminaries who are participating in this meet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sri Chatterjee. Uh, at this juncture, may I Please remind you ladies and gentlemen and young friends in the audience to kindly switch off your mobile phones and put them on silent mode if you haven't done so already. It is now my privilege and pleasure to request His Excellency, the Governor of West Bengal, Sri Keshwari Nath Tripathi, to deliver his inaugural address. Shri Kaushik Chatterjee, the Managing Director of Tata Steel, Mr. Raskin Bond, Dr. Jayant Singh Gupta, Srimati Malvika Banerjee, and ladies and gentlemen present here, my friends from media. It gives me great pleasure to inaugurate the Tata Steel Kolkata Literary Meet 2015, our column as it has become fondly known. I welcome you all to the meet and trust you will have an enjoyable literary experience over the coming holiday weekend. Literature, in its broadest sense, is any written work. Typically, the term derives from Latin literatura, literally writing formed with letters, although some definitions include 
spoken or sung text. More restrictively, it is writing that possesses literary merit and language that foregrounds literariness as opposed to ordinary language. Literature can be classified according to whether it is fiction or non-fiction and whether it is poetry or prose. It can be further distinguished according to major forms such as novel, short story, drama and works that are often categorized according to historical periods or their adherence to certain aesthetic features or expectations. Definition of literature have varied from time to time. It's a culturally relative definition. In Western Europe, prior to the 18th century, literature as a term indicated all books and writing. A more restricted sense of the term emerged during the Romantic period in which it began to demarcate imaginative literature. Contemporary debates over what constitutes literature can be seen as returning to the older, more inclusive notion of what constitutes literature. Cultural studies, for instance, takes us as its subject of analysis both popular and minority genres in addition to canonical works. Dry definitions apart, what I find fascinating as a poet myself is the way the history of literature follows closely the development of civilization. When defined exclusively as a written work, ancient Egyptian literature along with Sumerian literature are considered the world's oldest literature. The primary genres of the literature of ancient Egypt, didactic text, hymns and prayers and tales were almost entirely written in verse. With us, supposed to be the oldest book, tell us about the culture, social visions, ideals and ideas. They inform us of history and remedies and solutions of human problems of spirituality and human behavior. Different historical periods are reflected in literature. National and tribal sagas, accounts of the origin of the world and of customs and myths which sometimes carry moral or spiritual messages predominate in the pre-urban era. The epics of Homer, dating from the early to middle Iron Age and the great Indian epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata also have evidence of deliberate literary authorship surviving like the other myths through oral tradition for long periods before being written down. My thinking is that literature in all its form can be seen as written records whether liter literature itself be factual or fictional. It is still quite possible to decipher facts through things like characters, actions and words or author's style of writing and the intent behind the work. The plot is for more than just entertainment purposes. Within it lies information about economics, psychology, science, religions, politics, cultures and social depth. Studying and analyzing literature becomes very important in terms of learning about our history. It is therefore with that thought in mind that I take all works of literature in its broadest sense and I would expect you to do the same. That is my philosophy of literature and a literary need such as this one is I believe one of the strongest platforms to propagate the importance of literature in our lives and indeed its importance to all of humankind. I would like to end my address with this very moving quote by the great Helen Keller. Literature is my utopia. Here I am not disenfranchised. No barrier of the senses shuts me out from the sweet gracious discourses of my book friends. They talk to me without embarrassment or awkwardness. I wish Kalam, Kalam every success and leave you to enjoy the fruits of this literary experience. Thank you. Jai Bhai. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your words of encouragement, underscoring the importance and relevance of such literary meets, even from the historical perspective. Kolkata Literary Meet has been making its mark in more ways than one over the last few years. And 
the beginning of such a festival, Kolkata Literary Meet, believes in making a mark also in a different style. So the formal inauguration of this Kolkata Literary Meet will be by signing on the canvas which is kept there. So may I request His Excellency, the Governor of West Bengal, to kindly formally inaugurate this literary meet by putting something on that canvas. And Mr. Ruskin Bond, you are requested to join in. Mr. Chatterjee, Dr. Jayanta Sengupta and Malavika Banerjee too. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. The Excellency has written, Literature is life and learning. Mr. Ruskin Bonsa. mightier than the sword, they say, and that's what Mr. Ruskin Bond believes. That's why he has written Kalam over there. We have all learned, Jo Shakti Sahitya Mein Chupi Hai, O Top Talwar Aur Bam Ki Golo Mein Bhi Nahi Pai Jati. Mr. Ruskin Bond, now that your marker has done the job of the Kalam, may we request you to say a few words on this occasion. Well, it's, it's wonderful to see so many book lovers out here and it's, uh, it's a sign that um, people are still reading and uh, literature is far from dead. Um, I came down night before last, uh, v very late, arrived in Calcutta about two in the morning and I, f I felt like a question mark and I looked like a question mark. <laughs> But seeing you all here today and uh, on this wonderful sunny Kolkata morning, I'm an exclamation mark again. Thank you. And uh, uh, I don't usually go to literary festivals because um, if I, uh, where would we do any writing if we were going around talking all the time? And uh, I've always felt writers should be read and um, not heard and certainly not seen. <laughs> but, but, but times have changed and um, we, are, we have to go out and promote our books and other people's books and literature in general, which is, um, which is a good thing, of course. And I, I couldn't refuse the invitation to come here because uh, I do owe a lot to, to Kolkata and to, and to Bengali literature because when I was a boy and I was stranded in an, in a, an, an island between England and France for t three years and I with great difficulty got hold of a, a collected plays of, and poems of Rabindranath Tagore 
and I read them one by one, the Crescent Moon, the Gardener, Gitanjali, the Post Office, Red Oleanders, and they all brought me back to India. And, um, and in a way convinced me that I had to come back and, and to make my writing career here itself. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for pointing out to us that you can make a mark even with question marks and exclamation marks, which can often eclipse commas and full stops. I would now like to request Srimadhi Malavika Banerjee, the moving spirit and the live wire behind Kolkata Literary Meet for the last few years, to propose a formal vote of thanks. Thank you, Your Excellency, for finding time to inaugurate this festival. Thank you, Mr. Bond, for finally giving in to our persuasive phone calls from Calcutta to Missouri. We've been calling you for three years, as you're aware. So thank you for making it down and meeting us plain people and speaking to us over this next one week. Thank you, Mr. Chatterjee, and uh, for all the support of Tata Steel. Your team has been very supportive and literally an extension of the column theme. And thank you all of you. I'm just overwhelmed. I hope to see many of you across the next five days. And uh, I hope you all enjoy what we've put together for you. Uh, Your Excellency had mentioned that literature is an inclusive, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a part of culture that's inclusive. And that's what we try to bring to you. There's economics, there's sport, there's music, and of course, there's pure literature. And finally, thank you, Dr. Senghutta and your team. You tolerate us for the whole year and then we really stretch our luck these five days. So thank you for your patience. Thank you very much and hope to see all of you in many sessions over the next five days. We'll be starting the next session in another five minutes, so please don't move. Thank you very much, Malavika. Uh, with that, we come to the conclusion of the formal inaugural part of this morning's program. May I request Dr. Jayanta Sengupta and Malavika to kindly escort the dignitaries to their respective seats so that in a short while we can begin with the next session or the first formal session, Bonding for Life with Mr. Raskin Bond. Meanwhile, may I draw your attention to the fact that the Twitter lines are open for this Kolkata Literary Meet. And you can start Twittering right now about your experiences at this inaugural event and being here at the Victoria Memorial. Hashtag Tata Steel Kalam. So start Twittering right away. And it will be posted immediately, of course. And there is a kind of canopy there, you see under the umbrella there. For those of you who would like to go there and get yourselves photographed, those will also be immediately uploaded on the social media. So there are lots of things for you to do on the periphery as well. So please bear with us for a few more minutes till we start the next session. And thank you for your patience. Ruskin has been writing since the age of 16, has been published since the age of 21, am I right? Uh, since since the age of one, no. no, twenty-one. Twenty-one. <laughs> Thank you. And sixty years, Raskin. Monadit. No, um, I am eighty years old. So that's well, years. sixty years of writing. Are you going to? Thank you. She's cut ten years off my age, so that's good. <laughs> well, he's been writing for sixty years now, which is a yes. fair bit longer than. Yes, yes, seventy-five, seventy-six, right about that. No. 60s, 60s. She is, is a math, I must tell you this, Jashia is a mathematician and the organizers of this event, knowing full well that I could never pass in mathematics at school, decided to have a mathematician um, handle me and deal with me and <laughs> interrogate me over here. We are not monsters, Mr. Bond. We are merely small time villains. <laughs> Anyway, but uh, just to give you an idea behind the humor, there's a Sahitya Academy Award in 1992 for our trees still growing there. There's a Padma Shri in 1999. And last year, Raskin was awarded the Padma Bhushan. So, um, yes, don't be, don't be fooled by the jokes. Um, 
We have an hour with us. Then. What what I propose to do is uh, not take very long asking questions. I'll ask a few of my own. I'll ask a few that have come into me via the Twitter feed and via Facebook um, from several places across the world. And then I shall throw the floor open to the audience. I mean, I have pages and pages of questions, but I don't want to be the only one asking them. Okay, so shall we start? Shall we? Yeah, okay. Um, so Ruskin, you've been writing since you were very, very young. And it looks like you made your mind up to be a writer when you were in your early 20s. Now, most people I've met in my early 20s and many of the young people out here who are here in groves to see you, uh, we really didn't know what we wanted at that age. How did you have that clarity? How did you know that early on? Well, in fact, um, I wanted to be a writer uh, well before I was 20, I, I, during my school days. Um, I was quite a bookworm. We had a, a good library in the school I went to and, and I really immersed myself in books and, and uh, by the time I'd finished school I was quite clear in my mind that um, I wanted to be a writer. I came home after finishing school 1950 and my mother said, now Ruskin, what do you want to do with yourself? What are you going to do in life? And I said, um, mom, I think I'm going to be a writer. And she said, don't be silly, go join the army. <laughs> in those days, every, almost every second boy would, would go straight into the army. Um, and sadly, that isn't so because the, actually the army is, is, a, is a great career. And uh, many of my friends did go into the army. But had I been so, you'd have had probably one more Beetle Bailey in the ranks. Um, so I think the army was probably much better off without me. Um, and I'm... In fact, my very first book was probably written when I was um, a schoolboy. Uh, it was a short novel. And I made the mistake, though, of putting my teachers and school staff into it. Uh, and writing funny things about them and it, it got into the hands of my classmaster who in, the, in those days you got flogged for anything, any misdemeanor. So um, I was punished and he, he tore up my exercise book in which I had written this masterpiece. Um, so, and that was the end of my first book. Um, so if, if you're going to start writing at a very young age or at school, Make sure you don't put your teachers in it. Huh? <laughs> now you've also written about a number of your family members. Um, and looking at the stories, well, they sound pretty eccentric. But do you have a personal favorite among them? Well, to tell you the truth, I, I, when I run out of ideas or stories, I fall back on uncles and aunts and and even fictitious um, relatives or I make them up um, and and one and two three of them are based on real people uh, but as time goes by I invent stories and fictionalize them and when I run out of relatives then I write ghost stories you can always cook up a ghost or two <laughs> So these are these are tricks that an that an author resorts to over a period of years when um, whenever he sort of um, <clears throat> runs out of creative imagination. So a lot of my you're right a lot of my characters are based on real people as indeed are most authors if they're honest will will tell you that many of the people they write about their characters even fictional ones are drawn from real life. And that's often the case with, uh, uh, with, with many, um, many great writers over the years. They, you do draw, draw on your own life to a great extent. So, um, Uncle Ken really existed? Uncle Ken did exist, but um, um, this uncle who was always getting into trouble and taking me along with him. Um, but as time went on and and the stories were popular and then I had to make up stories about him because after all um, you, you, 
I'm often accused of being a liar, but then a fiction writer is basically a liar, and you have to invent things as you go along. I'm going to ask you uh, one of the um, internet feed questions. This is from Amit, whose parents are from Dehradun, and who himself has grown up in Pune, which uh, you know, he's my age, so it, it would have been a very hilly town, a quiet colonial town at the time. And uh, he identifies with your writing hugely and, and wants to know what makes your writing so very visual. He said, I mean, he would take his summer vacations in Dehradun and come back with your books and just read them in Pune and he was in Dehradun again. Well, um, he's right. My writing is very visual. Um, and I think because um, I grew up perhaps being very conscious of the natural world around me, so I always took an interest in, in trees and plants and, and uh, birds and um, wildlife and pe basically people because you can't write stories without an interest in people. And um, of course places change and uh, I hope Amit if, on his visits to Dehradun is too disappointed because from being a, a small garden town 50 years back it, it's now a, a busy mini city full of uh, traffic congestion and um, and all the things that go with a growing city so he, he might be a little disappointed or disillusioned but if you're in a city the better ones and like Kolkata I've got a beautiful gardens and parks where you can you can get away from the harbor um, and so I would recommend him and others who live in urban areas to, to, to look for the greenery around them because it's there if you look for it. It's strange uh, how many people from these um, slightly hilly towns have identified and written to me. I have a second one here that I picked out of a set of three or four. And this is from Bharat, who's an old Bangalorean and now lives in California. And he says, way back when, you wrote a weekly column for the Deccan Herald. And you always reminded him of a milieu that was unhurried, that was innocent. And he wonders what you feel about all the changes around us, especially in the hills. So, uh, very similar to the earlier question. Well, change has to come. We can't avoid it. Um, we must make the most of it. But try our best to preserve what is good, what's good from the past. And, um, and enjoy that too. Um, the Deccan Herald is a paper I used to write for back in, in the 50s, 60s. You see, when I set out as a writer in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, publishing in India was in its infancy. There were very few book publishers around. and um, But I wanted to write and I wanted to make a living from writing. So I, I would really uh, write for almost every newspaper or magazine in the land, which took in the, the Deccan Herald of Bangalore, <coughs> sport and pastime of Chennai, <coughs> And in Kolkata, you had the Amrita Bazaar Patrika, you had the Hindustan Standard. These have gone now. Um, and um, the Tribune of Ambala and, and so many magazines and newspapers in those days actually did publish <coughs> stories, um, essays, poetry. So a writer uh, uh, did have a platform. <clears throat> now the magazines and the newspapers don't really have a literary platform or if they do a, a very limited one um, so writers have to look for publishers book publishers fortunately uh, the, the, the publishing industry has grown and um, I know many publishers who are doing very well um, and uh, the very fact that some of them can actually give me my royalties means they're doing well <laughs> Um, whereas 20, 30 years back, I would have to <clears throat> send frequent reminders to publishers um, asking them if they had any money for me. <laughs> and um, in fact, there was, there was one publisher I remember about 30 years back in Delhi and um, whenever I sent him a reminder for my royalties, he'd get himself admitted into the All India Medical Institute for, with, with heart, we used to get a heart, heart attack every time an author asked him for money. 
So um, publishing has, I think, changed over the years. You can, I think, reasonably expect that you will get something for your work. <coughs> Although when I see the number of vanity publishers that have sprung up and are taking large sums of money from aspiring young kids who want to see their name on a book, um, I'm not sure if, if they're doing a service to literature. Um, but still, I would never discourage anyone from writing. Um, I would just say that don't be in too much of a hurry to look for to, to look for fame and fortune. You know, all glory does come from beginning, uh, but you have to continue to. And so, uh, sometimes a, um, a dramatic beginning may end in disappointment. Um, if, if you don't have the, the, the perseverance to, to continue in, uh, through disappointments and um, low periods. Um, well, this almost dovetails into the next question I wanted to ask you. Uh, writing is uh, something a lot of parents now encourage their children to do, which is wonderful. What I find, however, is that a, a, a lot of parents feel that it is something that uh, children can be pushed into or taught or it's, it's, it's like biology or well, your dreaded subject mathematics or something to be put under a lens, examined, measured and, you know, uh, calibrated. Now, does uh, writing actually work like that? And I grew up, you know, in an atmosphere of uh, people quite happily living, you know, leaving me alone to read or to write or, or whatever. And that was actually easier for me, but is it different now? What do you feel? Well, I think it, it's very important that young people should write well and have a, have a, a good command over language um, and whatever language they're going to use throughout life. Um, they don't necessarily have to become famous writers or make a living from literature, but after all, you can have a, a scientist who wants to write a treatise, um, a doctor who wants to write a medical book, um, a businessman who wants to conduct his business globally or internationally, and a, a good command of the language, whether it's English or whatever language you're going to use, gives you such an advantage. So I think it is important for youngsters and kids to, to give importance to their mastery uh, of the language they're going to use, to write fluently, to uh, write with individuality, and if, if at the same time they can be creative and write stories and books, that's great. But even otherwise, there's nothing like having a good command of language because that will help you in, in whatever, in whatever um, career you choose to follow. So, interestingly, uh, we've been having this raging uh, debate on freedom of expression for a while now uh, in Indian books and literature. Uh, but it's always in, in the realm of books written for adults. Um, when, however, we talk to our own children, you know, we're such proponents of free speech, but where is free speech vis-a-vis -vis children's right to express themselves? Where do you stand on this? Oh, you mean, uh, I think children uh, discover their own books and they do so at different ages. Sometimes, I mean, I remember as a boy going at a very early age, but <coughs> going straight from children's books <coughs> into adult literature. And you can't really keep things from children. If, if mommy and daddy don't want you to read a book and uh, hide it in a way in a cupboard or on the top of a shelf, then um, then uh, your, the, the little boy in, in the house is going to go out of his way to discover that book and look for it and read it um, bec simply because he's been told not to. So sometimes being uh, uh, being told that certain books or certain kinds of are not good for you is, is really has the opposite effect. and, and um, uh, the, it's an incentive to, to really go and discover it. Um, but I think good writing always transcends. You get bad writing and you, 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 um, there are 
I think as we, the more we read, the, the more capable we are of, of judging and uh, between what's good literature and, and what's shoddy. So I'm not too worried, therefore, on about um, right. the curbs on freedom of expression because we, we, of, we find our own freedoms one way or another. Right. Um, well, if... Um, oh, shucks, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> my train of thought. Hang on, I've got it right here somewhere. Um, yes. So when you write, when you write for children or for adults, I mean, is this a conscious decision you take? Or do you just write and does someone else decide this book is suitable for a child or that book is suitable for an adult? If you, yeah, do it. For, for, that's the first part. Basically, I, I write for myself. Um, in other words, I won't be writing a story or a, an essay or a poem unless I'm enjoying it, unless it's giving me pleasure. And if it gives me some pleasure and satisfaction, hopefully it will give somebody else the, the same thing. <clears throat> and uh, for many years, I never wrote deliberately for children. I never wrote down to them. Occasionally, people in the um, educational world might have felt a particular story of mine was suitable for children and they, they put it into an anthology or a school reader. Um, so it's, it's really only in, perhaps in recent years where I've been asked to write a story specifically for children. Because I think in, in, uh, in this day and age we're inclined to put people into compartments and say this is suitable for kids between 8 and 10 and this is good for young adults between 15 and 16. Whereas um, I, 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 when I go back to my own boyhood, it's just that books were there and, and uh, young people enjoyed certain kinds of books and older people others. But they weren't categorized or you weren't put into compartments. So I might have started off with Alice in Wonderland and then suddenly shifted to <clears throat> to uh, Dickens or when I was 12 or 13 reading Somerset Maugham or, or um, adult writers of that period or that era. So <clears throat> so I don't think we should put things in, in um, age groups or categorize them. Or just discover what, what you like and then um, read as much as you can or, uh, and as much as you enjoy reading. Now, uh, you've uh, mentioned in Love Among the Bookshelves, which is your anthology on your favorite writers, that you are a great fan of ghost stories and you've written a fair few. Um, which one is your personal favorite? Well, to be on perfectly honest, I made them all up. I'm still waiting to meet a ghost and I doubt if it will on this sunny morning here at Unless Queen Victoria appears suddenly on the ramparts of the <laughs> Victoria Memorial. Um, but I, I did grow up on um, ghost stories and in, I enjoy reading them. It gives you a... Young people like them because it gives, gives you a thrill or you... F it's what I call a safe fear. You know, something terrible is going on, but at the same time, you know, it's not going to happen to you. So you can uh, in, enjoy the... Uh, enjoy the story or if it's a film you you enjoy the film and um, so over the years the, the ghost story has been um, there have been many great writers who who've used it uh, Walter de la Mer and M.R. James and Algon and Blackwood in more recent years writers like Stephen King and others so um, it, it's a genre in itself which um, seems to attract readers so among uh, but, these, Ruskin, just interrupting, do you have a favorite ghost story among all these writers, M.R. James, Sheridan Lafanu, uh, Walter de la Mer, um, and, and the others? Do you have any specific one that you would like the audience to perhaps read at some time? Well, I, I would take a, a collection of M.R. James, which um, uh, would appeal to people with an academic background, ghost stories of an antiquity. Hmm? Um, or a warning to the curious. That those are the titles of two of his collections. And um, <clears throat> Walter de la May also wrote a sh short novel, The Return, which was a ghost story. But usually the ghost story doesn't work so well in the novel form. It seems to be in the short story form. How come you haven't 
ever written a detective thriller. You're such a fan of detective stories. I did write a detective story once. Nobody would publish it. It was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that uh, um, there are many Bengali writers who are very successful at writing detective stories. Uh, of course, such a Jerry, such a Jitre was one of them. And um, and even today, I I believe it's quite a successful genre in Bengali literature. So maybe I'll pinch something from them or I'll get an idea there. <laughs> and those swashbuckling adventures, because you like R. L. Stevenson, you've played, uh, you know, your book says so, and I thought uh, perhaps you'd write one. Yes, well, I enjoyed it. I used to read de detective fiction, thrillers, I still do, um, and um, adventure stories. I've done a new rusty book for children called Rusty in the Magic Mountain, which has got a mixture of of realism and fantasy and and um, and there's a ghost in it too. Um, your uh, book that's due to come out on um, it's um, it's from Speaking Tree uh, Speaking Tiger, the newest publisher. Um, could you tell us a little bit about it? I believe it's called A Book of Simple Living: Brief Notes from the Hills. So yeah, so that's a, a, a book of simple living. Um, it's uh, it's it's not a full uh, full on autobiography. Yeah? This is uh, collections of uh, thoughts, observations, and um, notes from my diaries and notebooks. So it's, it's just a little book which would be helpful, hopefully, be helpful to the reader. Um, uh, as far as a f full on memoir or autobiography is, the, the, the trouble I, right as with the, as with most of us. We can't tell the truth about ourselves. Um, it's very hard for a, I think, a living writer to write an honest memoir or autobiography because there's so much you don't want to tell the world. Huh? We're all, we're all Dr. Jekylls and Mr. Hydes. We've got the the good side to our nature and the the, the unpleasant side, and we would rather not people know about the unpleasant aspects of our uh, our nature. So. We, we have to wait for somebody else to come along later on and, and write the, the, the real story or, or the real biography. And I was re recently reading a, a very good biography of Somerset Maugham, and a writer I always admired. And, uh, and even as a person, I thought he must be a, a fascinating individual. And he was, but by the time I'd finished reading this biography, I realized he was such a horrible, nasty man, and <laughs> you wouldn't have wanted to, yeah, to, to know him. So, um, it's very difficult then, I think, for a writer to write an honest autobiography. It's better to have somebody else come along and do it. And then, of course, you want to shoot him or her, if you're alive still. <laughs> so, before I, you know, uh, open the floor to questions, which is a hint for you to think up your question, I have one personal one to ask. Uh, young writers just starting out, um, young in a manner of speaking, in a manner of number of books published, not each. Uh, what advice, what practical advice do you have for us? Oh, practical advice. Um, be regular in your work, I'd say, um, to try to devote at least an hour or two every day to your writing. Um, I find the mornings are probably the best but it, whatever time of the day suits you. So I think a certain amount of discipline is definitely required. Um, so if you've done your two or three pages a day, or as P.G. Woodhouse would do his 1,000 words a day, you, you feel you've achieved something. And then by the end of the year, you've produced probably a couple of books. Um, so I think that certain amount of discipline is there. And if you're a young writer and you must expect disappointments. They came to me, they come to most of us. So, and I had, I had friends too when I was in my 20s who, who, who wanted to be writers, but they got discouraged very early. They were good writers, but because they weren't selling or because um, they weren't having their work accepted by publishers, they, they, they gave up the thought of being writers and went into some other profession where their skills, writing skills were, were useful. It could have been script writing or in, or copy editing or advertising. Um, 
because actual um, writing fiction or novels and stories just wasn't bringing in the money. Um, so if, if you really want to make a life, a lifelong vocation out of it, I call it a vocation rather than a profession, uh, then you must get used to disappointments, you must persevere, you must keep writing in spite of disappointments. And I always had as a sort of uh, motto, the lines, never despair. But if you do, work on in despair. So just keep working and sooner or like later you, you'll find there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and uh, I think um, you will you will succeed if you if you stick to it. Thanks, Raskan. I'm going to open the floor to questions now. So, um, do we have mics? Or oh, we can shout. <laughs> oh, you can shout out your questions. Oh, so, the first one, yes. How far is nature responsible in making me the kind of writer I am? It's uh, 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 very um, um, responsible. It's it's um, nature has over the years become of greater importance to me as time goes by. Uh, I, as a boy, I rather took nature for granted, as most of us do. But the 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 longer I've lived and the closer I've become to the the world of nature, the more I realize how important it is to me, not just as a writer, but to all of us as human, as human beings and to people who live and um, who must live in this world. And that how lucky we are to have these trees around us and, and these flowers and this um, beautiful environment. And um, it's something that we have to look after for ourselves and our children. Uh, the mic, one second, please don't call out. The mic is with this young lady. Uh, when you wrote the story of uh, the night uh, when the roof blew off, did it actually happen? Thank you. Yes, you're right. The roof did, my roof did blow off in a storm. And um, <clears throat> it was, it was snowing too later that night. And, and my, I had my bed covered with snow. Now, <clears throat> that sounds very romantic and f and uh, full of fun but it wasn't it was a horrible night actually <laughs> i don't want it to happen again and um, rakesh my uh, grandson here he was a little boy at the time and uh, so he i remember him climbing onto the roof to try and put part of it back on Yes. Uh, this is a small boy. Then. Yes, small boy with powerful mic. Mr. Bond, could you just tell me, Mahmood, was he really Jim Corbett's grandson? Oh, was this? He, he's um, talking about a, a, a book I wrote a couple of years back called Tigers for Dinner, in which, um, as a small boy, um, we had a we had a cook who used who, used to tell everybody he was Jim Corbett's cook and he told me these stories about um, tigers and crocodiles and and um, wildlife and he made them all up of course they were tall tales and um, till today son I'm not sure whether Mahmood actually was Jim Corbett's cook or not because I believed him <laughs> and it's only when I think back and I sometimes wonder hmm? Did he really make it all up? Just as I, as a writer, make up so many stories. <laughs> uh, I'd like you to ask the question, please, uh, Orange Jacket. Yeah. Do you have a mic? Doesn't matter, just shout. Your grandpa Zoo really existed? Pardon? Your grandpa Zoo really existed? Did my grandson really exist? Grandpa Zoo. Oh, did my grandfather really exist? No. <laughs> no, no. The zoo. Okay. To tell you the truth, you see, writers sometimes are big liars. Huh? Now, I always wanted 
a grandfather. You see, both my grandfathers died before I was born. But I wanted and still want to have a grandfather. So I write stories about an imaginary grandfather and make him do interesting things and keep pets and, and, um, and kids. And so they become the grandfather for other children too. <laughs> um, there's a lady here with the mic. What should I do if I want to be an author? You want, you want to be an author? Yes. That's, that's very good and um, you must work towards it. But my best advice to you is to read lots of books because I think almost every successful author was a great reader. So if you're fond of books and other authors and you're fond of reading, that will give you a great advantage as you go along. Right, I'm going to ask you. Um, Yes. What idea and from where do you get those ideas to make such books? I get from little girls like you. <laughs> you need to pass on the mic to the gentleman in the green shirt, please. He's been waiting for a long time. Rusty, good afternoon. Uh, in scenes, uh, uh, your memoir, uh, you wrote that. Uh, you are blessed with dual heritance. Uh, did Rusty ever feel any sense of exile? Well, yes, when he was, uh, when he went to England, um, he did uh, miss his home and friends and in India so much hmm, that he um, the <clears throat> came back as soon as he could afford it. Um, so I felt a sense of exile there. I never really f felt any sense of exile in India um, because I think if you, the, the place you grow up in, your, from birth and childhood on, um, where you have your roots and, and your earliest memories, <coughs> that, I think that's home and that's uh, <coughs> the place you will always want to come back to, um, no matter where you go. Or how old you become? There's a lady who's been waiting to ask a question for a while. Can I? Can I? Can I give her the mic, please? She's been waiting. Did you really fall in love with the young girl in the train to early? <laughs> Not only her, but several others. <laughs> that was my romantic period in my 20s. I was always writing stories about beautiful girls on railway stations. Unfortunately, I don't travel by train anymore, so I, I don't know if they're, they're still there. Um, and if she is, she'd be my age. <laughs> um, I, could I just ask you to uh, pass a mic there, this gentleman with his hand up for a while, blue shirt. You have a good sense of color. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bond, uh, when you were a child, did you ever want to become something else? Where are you? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I was a child, did I want to become something, something else? Other than a um, yes, I wanted at one time to be a tap dancer. <laughs> but I don't have the figure for it now. <laughs> then I wanted to be a football player. And I used to play a lot of football, but you see, at, at the age of 80, I can still write stories, but kicking a football around and... I can kick the football, but I'm not going to run after it, that's for sure. So, what uh, made you choose this uh, writing as your... Well, it's the thing I did best. <laughs> writing was the thing I did best. So, always, I think, follow your... Try to make your life revolve around whatever you can do best. Right. There, there, there's a lady at the back there and a gentleman. They've been uh, waiting for a long time to ask a question. I think I'm just uh, a little bit biased uh, towards the people in the front. So, right at the back, please. Yeah. Yes. But in the meantime, anyone? Um, yes, please. Ask your question. Hello. Here. When I started writing books, with writers, many writers actually, because 
I had grown up on the classics to a great extent. On I'd read all the works of Charles Dickens, Shakespeare. Of course, we had to study in school, and I. I, I, I have to admit, I used to fall asleep uh, in, in the middle of As You Like It or Merchant of Venice. But, but um, then I went on to popular writers. I enjoyed reading P.J. Woodhouse or Agatha Christie or maybe more serious novelists, Compton McKenzie and Somerset Maugham. Now, these are all writers of that era, the 1940s, etc. Um, so and naturally, that's the writers you read as a boy or a girl that are going to influence you. Um, so many writers influence me. So, uh, ma'am, do you have a mic now? Yes, yes, I yeah, do. Loudly, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Vaughan. You write most of your stories from the Masuri. So, do you think the Masuri is the only place or the best place to write about the nature? Oh no, no. You can write about nature wherever you are. Um, you can. You. You love the place. No, no, I, I like living there. But any writer worth his or her salt <coughs> should be able to write, as as many famous writers have done, in 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 difficult conditions. You know, in in a small attic room, or you know, or in a crowded city or tenement. Um, the the desire to write is is can be so strong that it it doesn't matter where you live or what your circumstances are. You, if you want to write, you will write. So you don't have to have beautiful surroundings. Thank you, sir. Yeah, the gentleman next to you. Yes, you've been waiting for Good morning, I'm Venu Speak on Twitter. I read your book, The Flight of Pigeons, in the 80s, and I'm gifting classic uh, Ruskin Bond part 1 and 2 to my 17-year-old son. My question to you is, how is reading when no television existed and for, in the social media world? Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, sir. I will. <laughs> and uh, you're right. You know, um, in my school days, there was no television. There, there was no internet, of course, and no video games. And, and none of the things that we are today blaming for um, the absence of the reading habit. And actually, the reading habit is not absent. It's, it's always been a minority pastime. Now, even when I was at school, and I'm going back uh, to my school days, in a, in a class of 35 boys, there were just and we had a good library, but there were just two or three of us who were actually fond of reading books. And uh, you didn't have television or all these distractions. Other students, well, they read comics. Once a month you went to the cinema, to the pictures. But reading was always just a few people, uh, um, a, a few kids who were fond of it. Today it's still a minority pastime, but that minority in actual terms of numbers has grown and grown and grown because of education and the greater, larger number of people who can read. Um, the lady in black, so you've been now. waiting for a long time. Yeah. No, my Hindi is very poor. It's, it's masala Hindi. It's straight out of Bollywood. I couldn't write a book in. <laughs> I, I practiced it before. <laughs> Ma'am, I'll give you a mic. Uh, she's been waiting for a very long time. Um, and, and you, little girl in pink. You take my mic. Ask your question. Did you really run away from Arundhal? Did I really? Run away from Arundhal. You wrote in Adventures of Rusty. Did, Did really? you really run away from, from Arundhal? From school? From Arundhal. Arundhal? Oh, see, she remembers my story better than I do. <laughs> Arundel was the name I gave to a school in a story. Is that right? Yeah. I, I ran away from school for uh, about two days, but uh, I didn't take enough pocket money with me, so I just I had to come crawling back next day feeling very hungry. <laughs> Good so, afternoon, Mr. Bond. Uh, may I ask you, have you been ever influenced by Harry Potter? Not really, because Harry Potter is a recent phenomenon, a very successful one. Uh, so my my influences go back much earlier. As uh, but I'm sure kids today will be influenced by Harry Potter because they're growing up. You, the books that you grow up on are the ones that will influence you. But I meet uh, youngsters who some like Harry Potter, others might prefer Roald Dahl or, or other, or other popular writers. 
read as much as read everything you you can. Hello, Raskaran. Where is she? So, so this question has been haunting me since class six. So, how would the scenario shape up? If the author really trudged down the dusty roads of Delhi in in order to search the girl with the green eyes, yes. Um, you want to know the end of that story? Yes, sir. Well, I don't know the end of it either, so it's it's still in limbo. I often get asked that question: What happened to the girl on the platform at Delhi? And I, I, you know that that station is still there. Um, but I don't see the girl anymore. <laughs> Sir, was room on the roof chiefly autobiographical in those days? So for the, you. The room on the roof? Mm? Yes, the room on yes. the roof. Mm? What was the question? I said, was it chiefly autobiographical? The, Sorry, chiefly? The book, Room on the Roof, was. does it have an autobiographical element? Oh, yes, it does. But you see, I wrote... The Room on the Roof, when I was 17, it, it started out as a journal. But when I <clears throat> showed that <clears throat> journal to a publisher, uh, this the, the editor there, a very famous editor, Diana Atil, told me, Ruskin, this journal in itself doesn't make a book. But if you turn it into a novel, you might have a book there. So I sat down and I, did, and I turned my journal into a novel. And I submitted it again. And she said, that's interesting, but it still isn't good enough. So, can you write it again and bring in some more interesting characters? So I wrote it a third time and, and created some characters. So it ends up, it's a mixture then of fiction and fact. <coughs> but I wrote three drafts before it got published. So it wasn't, you don't just sit down and write a book and, and you're famous overnight. You often have to work hard on it. Yeah? Uh, in your... In your book, a photograph. Did you actually find a photo, the photo, the photograph of your grandmother? That little story I wrote many years back. That, yes, that's a true story. Some stories actually are written as they happened. Others I have to develop. Yes, develop is the word. Hello, uncle. Yeah. Did Toto really exist? Toto, the monkey, existed. Um, when I was a small boy, but monkeys don't live 80 years, so it's no longer around. Uh, but there are monkeys in Missouri who come in through my open window and they're very troublesome. And one ran away with my pajamas last month. <laughs> they're still hanging from a tree down the hillside. <laughs> now, uh, the last question, I'm going to give it to uh, the gentleman with the scarf and the blue pullover at the back here because he's been waiting for a long time. Uh, people, I know you are all, all very keen to ask Ruskin his questions, but our time is up and we have to maintain timeliness. So here's the thing, Ruskin, you will be signing, won't you? Sitting here in the sun, I am now redder than your sari, all those salvias there. <laughs> so, if I sign books, it won't be over here. No, 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 no. We'll find you a nice shady spot. By the way, books are available for sale at Mohar Kunjo. Yeah. So, last question. No, you. Uh, first of all, welcome to Kolkata, Mr. Bond. And uh, to be very honest, my voice is quivering because uh, to be in front of you today, it's just an honor. And I've been your fan from reading the children's only bus by Raskin Bond when I was in school. Uh, my question to you would be, uh, even in various stories like The Girl from Copenhagen and uh, uh, The Room on the Roof, uh, various other novels, The Night Train at Delhi and everyone, like we see so much passion, love in your heart. Uh, like, how come you never settle down with someone, like your late love or someone like this? This has intrigued me for a long time. Well, thank you. Now, you asked me a very personal question. You will have to come and see me in Missouri one day, and I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> but um, um, it's, it's a very long story. You see, that's the story of my life. So I can't um, uh, um, conclude it right here now in a few words. Um, but um, 
if you, if you read more of my work, you'll probably get the answer. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been wonderful. I mean, what can I say? People are just waiting, but it's hot, and, and I think Ruskin needs a spot of shade, and he needs to sit down, but he will be signing your books in a quiet area. Uh, announcements will be made vis-a-vis -vis that. Uh, in the meantime, Ruskin, would you please, uh, please accept from Dr. Jayanta Shen Gupta, this bouquet. Okay. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience.